Among Hindus, the notion of historicity is very problematic. Once I asked the scholar of the Mahabharata whether the epic Mahabharata is historical or not, and he said, that is a perverse question. Well, <laughs> I don't think so. You see, of course, for listeners to a story, it's not so important from when that story dates. I'll give you an example from European literature, the story of Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf. Uh, some people say that it is a very ancient story, uh, that, that the Little Red Riding Hood is really the dawn goddess from Indo-European mythology you know, Usha in the Vedas, and stories like that. And that the, the big bad wolf is really the night uh, from which the dawn is an escape. But other people say, well, no, it is only, it's a French story from the 17th century where red simply signifies frivolousness. And so it's not so profound at all, it's like just a story. Well, I can't decide on that, but you see, that is the type of question that historians can ask about stories. You see, when did they originate? And it's not a question that has to be important. Nobody should care about it. But for historians, it is the kind of question that you can ask. So I'd like to know that. when. If at all, did the Mahabharata take place? <clears throat> now, modern Hindus, or many of them at least, say, well, it has nothing to do with history. But the writers of the Mahabharata clearly thought differently. You see, they called it Itihasa. Itihasa is the modern Hindi word for history. You see, in a university, the, the, the history department is called Itihasa. And um, literally, it means, thus indeed it was. Now, this expression, thus indeed it was, is almost literally the definition given by Leopold von Ranke, a 19th century German scholar who is considered the father of modern scientific historiography. You see, who said that history is the reconstruction of things as they have really been? And I think that's a good definition. You see, unlike the postmodernists who say that anything may have happened and it is we ourselves who decide what happened and so on. Nonsense. You see, something really happened. And it is either this or that. It's not something in between. And so we'd like to know what it was that really happened. You see, that's history. Now, the writers of the epic thought that that is what they were providing, an account of what really happened. Then later, of course, it got embellished and stories were added and so on. But nevertheless, there is a historical core. And I think there is. There really was a war of succession in the Bharata dynasty. So that's not, um, not a modern attempt to read too much into it. No, that is entirely fair to the stated intention of the writers. And indeed, you see, it was the job of poets in those days, especially of court poets, to make their patrons immortal by singing their stories in a pleasing way that would survive, that people would keep on singing, would keep on enacting. So, what pleads in this case for the historicity? Uh, first of all, a number of protagonists appear in the Puranic king lists. 
And here again, you have the, the core, the backbone of the job of poets in those days. It was to recount the history of their people, of which the, the central part was precisely the list of kings. And um, it would have been impossible to write the history of ancient Egypt or of ancient Mesopotamia without the king lists of those cultures. It is only in the case of India that scholars have decided to, um, to pull, pull these lists and to think that, oh, well, these Indians only have a lot of fantasy but no sense of history. You see, something is to be remarked on the Indian sense of history in the sense that of many important people, we don't even know what century they lived in. Whereas in China, practically every event is dated to the day exact. Uh, but nevertheless, those king lists are very worthwhile and they go to a time depth unique in the world. You see, according to Greek ambassadors in, in, living in India, in the last centuries before Christ, the, um, the king lists that they knew went back to what is now seen as the equivalent of 6776 BC. So that is impressive and that is unique in the world. Um, so these, these lists have to be taken seriously. Often, you see in different versions, you see slight variations, but that only proves that they're historical. It is like when the police asks the bystanders of a car accident, what did you see happen? And so each version will be slightly different, yet you can recognize that they are all talking about the same event. So here also, this history really happened. You see, these king lists do reflect a succession of kings that really existed. And so among them are the protagonists of the Mahabharata. You see Krishna, Yudhishthira, Parikshit, and so on. They are really part of those king lists. Uh, you do see some political developments uh, reflected in those king lists. For example, the Pandavas, which is one of the warring clans, they set up the city of Indraprastha. Then uh, when they win the war, but lose heavily in terms of their own people, many people get killed. Their cousins also, they lose the war. And so it is a different tribe, namely the Yadavas, that take over the city of Indraprastha. You can see how this corresponds to what happens in the epic. The Bharata clans fight among each other. And so ultimately they lose together. You see, because of their infighting, other neighboring tribes advance at their expense. And that is reflected in other historical data. Then there are a number of coherent time markers. There are, first of all, astronomical data a very important scene in the Mahabharata concerns the death of Bhishma. And he has the special boon of being able to decide on the moment of his own death. So he lies dying, but he holds off death for a few weeks. And he wants to die only when the um, uh, sun has passed into the, uh, or the full moon rather, has passed into the asterism of Magha, which is uh, the stars around Regulus in Western parlance. And uh, we know when that was, you see, the star Regulus passes the solstice axis in about 2300 BC. And there is a movement in the star, stars called the precession, which takes about 71 years for one degree of motion. Uh, one degree corresponding to one day, roughly. And it is said that Bhishma died on the eighth day. In fact, there is a small festival among Hindus called Bhishmashtami, 
the eighth day of the moon of Bhishma. So what we're talking about is 2,300 years plus seven or eight times 71 years, which brings us into the 18th century BC. Or a bit later, because it is not said that the asterism starts exactly on the day of the solstice, it might be a bit later, which corresponds to a few centuries later. But so it is in that period, middle of the second millennium, that this war must have taken place. This is confirmed by a number of archaeological types of evidence. We know that the Saraswati River dried up around 1900 BC. We know that during the battle, the river had indeed dried up. We find at some point one of the heroes, Bhima, is going to visit his grandparents in Gandhara in Afghanistan. And he crosses all the northwestern rivers of India. Now, the Saraswati does not figure among them. We find that during the battle, Balarama, who is the brother of Krishna, goes on pilgrimage along the course of the Saraswati River. And he goes to the place where the Saraswati River disappears in the desert. So at that point, you see, the Saraswati was not much anymore. And it was a river that disappeared. So we are talking definitely about after 1900 BC. Moreover, what happened in those days is because their main uh, source of livelihood, the course of the Saraswati River, disappeared, there was a big emigration. Emigration far to the west, all the way to Syria, where they set up the Mitanni kingdom, all the way to the east, to Magadha but also locally. They went upland and founded new cities there. And indeed, as the great archaeologist Bibi Lal has shown, those cities that are mentioned in the Mahabharata all arise only in the second millennium, not before. So some, some Hindus believe in a very ancient date, like 3139 BC. Well, in those days, there was no Indra Prastha, there was no Hastinapura, there was no Sonipat, no Panipat, and so on. All the cities that play a role in the Mahabharata are from the second millennium. Then there is chariots. You see, there is at the heart of the story a chariot battle. Now, some things may have been added in the retelling, but this is so central that it can't have been added we definitely know that it was a chariot battle with Krishna figuring in the story as the charioteer of Arjuna. Now, that is a very important chronological marker because at even 2500 BC, certainly 3000 BC, there were no chariots. And then later after 1000 BC, Chariots more or less disappeared. I mean, the knowledge of chariots remained, but it was only a sport. Like in the Roman arena, the gladiators used to have these races with chariots for amusement. But in real warfare, they were no longer used. So we are talking about a specific window, and that fits our estimate of the middle uh, second millennium. We have the same thing in the War of Troy in Greece, where um, we know that the historical war took place about 1200 BC, which then figured in Homer's uh, epic dated to about 700 BC. So we have a very uh, convergent evidence about a specific space and time which is what you ex would expect in a historical event. We also have the circumstance that, contrary to what many scholars nowadays would say, the idea of just inventing an epic is not typical for that age. Nowadays, a writer can sit down and invent something, though even there, of course, 
whatever story he invents will still have a relation with real developments, like science fiction, for example, will be about real developments taking place or expected to take place. And so in those days too, when they made a story, it was based on reality. And then they uh, went their own way, then perhaps fantasy was added, but there was a historical core. So in the case of Homer, there was a war in 1200 BC. In the case of the Mahabharata too, there was a real war. Then of course there were additions as the story grew bigger, longer, then uh, things were added. Uh, one thing that was added was older history. So you have things that may be historical, that were at any rate felt to have happened in reality. Like, for instance, there is a guest appearance of Parashurama, who is the hero of an earlier age. You have the summary of the Ramayana, which is an epic dated earlier than the Mahabharata. But you see that those are retellings of traditions that are well known. What is more difficult is the addition of later history. You see the writing of the Mahabharata started very soon after the event. And it was then still a very small story, the Jaya of eight. 1,800 verses, and it kept on growing for more than a thousand years. In that intervening period, many things happened, and some of them have also been added to the story. And there it becomes tricky for a historian to know what is part of the original story and what is, even though historical, not part of it, but added later. For example, we know that Krishna has to fight off attacks coming from the east uh, from the king of Magadha called uh, Jarasandha. Now we know that at the time of the Buddha, Magadha was a very uh, ambitious kingdom that became the uh, heart of the first empires in Indian history, the Nanda and the Maurya empires. So Magadha was always plotting to incorporate neighboring kingdoms or republics. And that story seems reflected in the attacks by Jarasandha on Mathura, where uh, Krishna takes the lead. Uh, now, we don't know, did Magadha have an earlier period of expansionism? Or on the contrary, is it that expansionism at the time of the Buddha that is reflected and that is projected back onto the age of the Mahabharata war, mid-second millennium? Those are interesting questions and I don't have the final answer to that. Then there are philosophical insertions, meditations on what dharma is, on what raja dharma is, that is to say what is the correct way of governing a state. There are insertions about yoga. And then there is also an ancestral narrative framework that goes back to the days of uh, Indo-European mythology. And that's a heritage that is common to uh, India, to Greece, to Scandinavia, to the whole Indo-European world. And so one can imagine as storytellers were recounting the events that really happened, they started adding more and more comparisons to uh, narrative themes that everybody knew, that their audience also already knew. And so the two got fused, the actual historical events and the mythological themes. Like, for example, it is said that Duryodhana is uh, immune, is uh, invulnerable, except for one body part. Now that is a very common theme, the same thing is said about Achilles in, uh, in, in Homer. The same thing is also said about Siegfried, the hero among uh, the Germanic people. And so we have a, an old narrative theme that reappears in the history 
that makes up uh, the core of the Mahabharata. So you have a lot of additions, you have a lot of things that in themselves are not part of this history. Nevertheless, they have all grown up around the historical core. This is acknowledged in the original. You see, it is said in the Mahabharata itself that there were three successive phases, the Jaya, then a much enlarged story, the Bharata, and then an even more enlarged story, the Mahabharata. Now, what really happened may be even more complicated, but at least it is recognized that there are successive stages. Now, that is very good because that accustoms Hindus to the notion of change. In the case of the Mahabharata, it is not that controversial to introduce the idea that it has an evolution, it has grown, it has evolved. In the case of the Vedas, this is much more difficult. And uh, I've had lectures where uh, people were really protesting when I introduced the notion of change, of evolution in Vedic history. So among a circle, a certain circle of traditionalist Brahmins, this still seems to be very difficult. The idea there is that the Vedas have always been that they are God-given, that they exist since creation, that there is no history in them, that it greatly detracts from their unique value to seek history in them, that it detracts from their unicity to seek comparisons with uh, Greek mythology, Scandinavian mythology, and so on. Um, yeah. That's also, for instance, why in the discussion about the Indo-European homeland, many Indians just protest against the very idea that there is such a thing as an Indo-European language family. Because that means that Sanskrit is related to other languages, that India is related to something beyond the Khyber Pass, and they just don't want that. They think it detracts from the unicity of Vedic tradition to relate it to anything at all. Well, uh, there I really have to dissent from this opinion. Um, in the case of uh, the Vedas, you can see, and I don't think that anyone can refute this, that they play out in Northwest India. All the places mentioned there are in Northwest India. Uh, you find no polar bears in there. You find no giraffes in there. Um, all the flora and fauna is North Indian. You have a certain window in time. You don't find cavemen in there. You don't find people watching TV or riding automobiles. You have a very specific window of time, namely Northwestern India during the Bronze Age. That's the time of the Vedas. Uh, so their technology is typical for that age, not earlier, not later. And then a number of events happen, and again they are typical for human history. There are marriages happening. Some people are the brother of another or the grandson of another. Uh, wars take place, and so on, all the usual things of human history. The Vedas are not a history book, but as human literature, they can't escape occasionally mentioning some human developments. And so they provide a key to historians to find out uh, when and where the uh, Vedic history took place. Uh, the um, Vedic poets, uh, it's also useful to see that they had a very specific place in society. They were not um, sannyasins or parivrajakas or, you know, outsiders to society who lived for uh, renunciation, for yoga. No, they were very much part of the heart of society. 
they were part of the court personnel. You see, they were court priests of kings. They were part of the elite. And there is one uh, hymn in the Rig Veda called the Muni hymn, where wandering ascetics are described. See, they're sky clad, meaning naked. They have matted hair and so on. You can easily recognize what is now known as the Naga Sadhus. But they are described in the third person. They are not the Vedic poets. So the Vedic poets are a very specific group of people. They are not uh, a, a separate class of yogis or something. Now, many Hindus say that everything comes from the Vedas. If you talk about yoga, they say, oh yeah, yoga is from the Vedas. If you bring in astrology or Ayurvedic medicine or so, it's from the Vedas. Well, I don't think so. There was a pre-Vedic history, and each of these things is older than the Vedas. You see, to say that there's a pre-Vedic history is like cursing in the church, as they say. Uh, many, many traditionalists don't like to hear that because they think that the Vedas are at the start of everything. And yet the Vedas themselves say that there is a pre-Vedic history. In, in one of the oldest hymns already, there is talk of the lawgiver Manu, the patriarch Manu, who is an ancestor, who is pre-Vedic. And there's already the notion of a law given by Manu. Now, the actual contents of that law may not be exactly the same as in the Manu Smriti, the book that we now have. But at any rate, this idea of an ancient law that is still valid for all mankind, that is already there. Then you have this whole genealogy. You have Ila, the daughter of Manu, and the foremother of the lunar dynasty to which the Vedic people belong. You have Nahusha who moves to the west. You see, he lives on the Ganga, then he moves to the Saraswati, and so on. So you have quite a bit of pre-Vedic history, and you have quite a bit of pre-Vedic culture in India. You see, we see the, the Harappan civilization stretch way back to like 8000 BC, for, for as far as we can see, you know, if more research is done, maybe it is even much older. Uh, we, find, uh, we find cities from Baluchistan all the way to the Ganga. Uh, recently, I know of uh, excavations in Campilia that showed the city to be much older than was thought hitherto. Um, so there was a whole civilization of which the Vedas are only a part, and not even a very early part. For example, and you see, let's not, uh, let's not take just any little detail, though that is, of course, also something to be done. Let's take the history of yoga. You see, nowadays in Europe, and in America, there is quite a bit of academic activity around the history of yoga. Uh, unfortunately, it's not so exciting. I would have liked you to, to say, uh, yes, you see, it's very ancient and so on. No, the current uh, academic opinion is that it is not ancient at all. They say that... Um, Yoga is not older than 2,500 years ago, than 500 BC, namely than the Buddha, because they all uh, say that it is uh, essentially the Buddha who started it all. You see this whole big civilization, these millions of people, Hindus, the Rishis and so on, they all did nothing worthwhile, and then suddenly the Buddha came and he created everything. And this is part, of course, of a political bias that in this case very seriously warps uh, history writing, where it is decided that uh, Hinduism bad, Buddhism good. Hinduism is the problem, Buddhism is the solution. If there is anything good in Hinduism, it must have been borrowed from Buddhism. 
if there is anything bad in Buddhism, it must be a contamination from ugly, vicious Hinduism. Uh, that's more or less the paradigm that most researchers in that area uh, work on. Uh, so it fits in that uh, story that uh, yoga is fairly recent. Now, we find already in the story of the Buddha himself, as told by Buddhist sources, that this can't be true. The Buddha himself had two yoga teachers, or two Sankhya teachers as they are called there, but he learns a number of meditation techniques from them. Meditation techniques that still are part of the Buddhist curriculum. Moreover, during his uh, fabled four meetings at 29 years of age, you see he meets a, a dying man and a dead man, uh, and he also meets a renunciate. And it is seeing this renunciate that gives him the idea, hey, I want to be a renunciate too. So rather than creating this culture of, of renunciation and yoga, he enters an existing tradition. And that tradition already existed. You know, there are very many indications for it, like you have the parallel tradition of Jainism. Unlike uh, the Buddha who is credited with creating everything, Mahavira Jina is considered as only the 24th in a lineage and of which at least the, the, his predecessor, Parshvanath, is definitely deemed historical, but he lived like two, three centuries earlier. So again, we have a sign that his uh, practice of meditation is already an established tradition. Then um, we have the Vedas. You see, of the Vedas, well, some Hindus say that everything is from there, yoga is also from there. There, of course, Western scholars say, no, you see, there is no yoga in the Vedas. The Vedas are very worldly. Of course, they, they contain uh, references to, to magical uh, activities, to ritual activities, to um, achieve the realization of certain wishes. Like, for instance, in the story of the Battle of the Ten Kings, the seer Vasishta prides himself on having achieved victory for his king Sudas by courting the god Indra so that Indra conferred victory on the battlefield to his own patron uh, Sudas. So it is all very human. You see, Ordinary humans would try to win a battle by putting up a good fight. Here, they want the same thing, namely victory in battle, but they have some extra means at their disposal, namely their Vedic hymns that somehow would propitiate the gods. But you see, the whole operation is very ordinary, is uh, it's all too human. They desire something. And in Buddhism, at least, we know that desire is considered the problem, that you shouldn't try to fulfill your desires. No, on the contrary, you should grow away from your desire. Um, so uh, it is said that um, in the Vedas, you have something else. You have tapas. And tapas means that you desire something, and by practicing asceticism, by practicing renunciation or penance, you increase your power, you attract a positive destiny. And so uh, by, uh, by practicing asceticism, you can achieve things that ordinarily you couldn't. Like there is the story, it's in fact a post-Vedic story, uh, about the rivalry between Vishwamitra and Vasishta. And so Vishwamitra wants to achieve what Vasishta has, and therefore he starts practicing asceticism for a thousand years or something, so to increase his own power so that he becomes worthy of achieving what he wants. 
So that is deemed something else than yoga. Now I'm not so sure because uh, yoga has many definitions in the beginning. And by the time Patanjali writes his Yoga Sutra, you can consider it as a sort of purification, a sort of correction uh, of the many uh, yoga traditions that exist and that he considers less than perfect. So it is an attempt at improvement on a number of traditions that already exist. Um, and anyway, you see, even though this, uh, this phenomenon of trying to achieve things through ritual, through magical procedures, is certainly present in the Vedas, the spirit uh, that they call the spirit of yoga, that certainly is the spirit of Buddhism, namely renunciation, namely non-desire, that is also present in the Vedas. Like you have the famous story in the riddle hymn uh, of uh, the two birds sitting in a tree. One of the birds is enjoying the berries. The other bird is just watching on. It's, uh, it's just looking on. Uh, so that's the classical image of, on the one hand, people who are engrossed in worldly pursuits, and on the other, people who are renouncing. So that is already there in the Vedas, and so I don't think the Vedas are the origin of this, as some Hindus would say. I don't think the Vedas are uh, without it, as some Western scholars would say. I just think that the Vedas are part of a culture where this is present, and so sometimes they refer to it, sometimes they don't. On the whole, probably uh, the phenomenon of yoga was older than the Vedas. And in particular, I want to refer to some, um, some suggested uh, proofs of yoga in the Harappan civilization. You see, Western scholars nowadays uh, make it a point to say that what you see in uh, things like the Pashupati seal, where some, some character reminiscent of Shiva is sitting in lotus posture, or in, in either in Padmasana or in Bhadrasana, um, with his back straight, his eyes closed, that this is not yoga. You see, they say, ah, but you see, in a hot climate like India, people are naturally supple, and so even a tailor doing his job can sit in lotus posture. So the fact that somebody is sitting in lotus posture doesn't prove anything. Well, yeah, but you see, that is something that people would say who have no experience of yoga at all. You see, when you look at these characters, you can see that they are sitting in yoga, that they are concentrating, that they are you see, taking the discipline of a, of a really correct posture that facilitates meditation and that they have their, their eyes closed, that they are concentrating on something internally, that they are not busy with the tailor's job or some other worldly pursuit. So I think very definitely uh, these characters in, in uh, Harappan depictions are yogis. Similarly, in the Mahabharata, you have the story of um, Arjuna practicing penance and doing yoga postures. So, you know, this are, these are bits and pieces, but if you put them all together, what emerges is a picture of a society where yoga was known. And of course, not everybody was practicing it, and there were different forms of it, different ideas of it, all true. But nevertheless, it was present. And so um, now generalizing from yoga to Hindu civilization in general, I think it was very much there. And the Vedic uh, tradition is only part of it. Uh, it's, it's only part of it geographically. It's only in one particular area around the Saraswati River that it grew up, whereas Hindu civilization was already much larger. In fact, it is, a, it is a prejudice of the uh, Aryan invasion believers 
that the Vedic culture is the source of all of Indian or all of Hindu culture. You see, they think, okay, they came from outside India, then they settled in Punjab, there they had the Vedic culture, and then they moved on and conquered all of India. And so all of India is indebted to Vedic culture. Now that is not what happened. You see, Vedic culture happened in a very specific locality that was part of uh, a much larger Hindu civilization. You also see it linguistically. Uh, Bengali is not a descendant from Sanskrit. It is a descendant from one of the sister dialects of Sanskrit. You see, all of North India had different variations of Indo-Aryan, of which Sanskrit was only one. And Sanskrit has remained, thanks to Vedic literature, these other dialects have disappeared, but their daughters and granddaughters, which is the modern Indo-Aryan languages, still exist. So, to sum up, what we know of ancient Indian history suggests that there was a large civilization. Uh, it was originally called Indus civilization. Then the Saraswati area was added. Then the area of the Gujarat coast was added. Now more and more uh, parts of the Ganga Basin are being added. So there was a very large civilization of which the uh, Vedic dynasty was only one small part. And the Vedic dynasty, the Bharata dynasty, then later had some eventful developments that became the core of the Mahabharata. But that too was only one part of a much larger Hindu civilization. So um, I think it's important to realize that uh, you people are uh, descendants of the largest uh, civilization of antiquity that we know of. And that it is not so much indebted to the outside world, that on the contrary, it gave a lot to the outside world. That it is we who have learned from it, rather than you who have learned from us. Thank you.